Welcome. You are listening to Purpose Driven Wealth, the podcast for empowered investors. If you're an investor who is tired of playing the Wall Street casino, stay tuned. On this show, we bring on industry experts to discuss leading strategies to help you make empowered decisions with your hard earned capital. And now, here is your host, Mo Bina. Welcome to Purpose Driven Wealth. I'm your host, Mo Bina. Today on the show, we have Fletcher Wheaton. Fletcher is a real estate investor and broker based in Los Cabos, Mexico. He helps Americans diversify their investments through Mexican real estate. Fletcher, welcome to the show. Mo, thank you for having me on. Excited to be here. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Uh, Fletcher, can you please talk about your background and, and why you moved to Mexico? Yeah, um, so I've always been in real estate. You know, when I graduated uh college me and my father started a portfolio of rental properties in new orleans and uh real estate has always been my passion and um it was about 2015 when it was me and my sisters would all gone through college and off the tab uh you know my father's got uh his stock portfolio, he's got some real estate holdings, and he's just kind of looking to do something with his money. And he subscribed to an international real estate newsletter. Mm -hmm. And one of the offerings was in Cabo. So uh, he mm -hmm. put a deposit down on a pre construction house site unseen, and asked me if I wanted to go visit the location, you know, and, and scope the real estate, see Cabo, all that stuff. And I said, Hey, like a free beach trip I'm I'm in and it just so happened about two hours into the trip after we landed uh he gets a phone call and it was the agent that was randomly assigned by the developer that was Elisa and Elisa is now my wife so what turned into a little scouting trip for real estate um has turned in a little bit more than that Elisa has been in real estate here since 2010 um myself about 2016 ish and um Right now, my mother and I have a portfolio of six properties and a piece of land here. And I, you know, on top of that, I, I help Americans, generally, mainly Americans and Canadians buy real estate here as a means of diversification, as a means of vacation home. Um, it it kind of runs the gamut. Wow, nice. And very fortuitous to meet your wife that way as well. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't have uh, wrote that one any any different, you know. Nice. Uh, and so what geographic markets in Mexico uh, do you focus on and why? So um, really beach markets and in general, it's going to be Cabo. And Cabo is at the tip of Baja, California. Mm -hmm. sir. And it's one of the younger places within Mexico, right? So we've really seen Cabo turn into a tourist destination i would say right around like maybe the 90s but even then you were a pioneer so we're really talking about the 2000s in 1980 cabo had a population of 10,000 people and today it's 351,000 the entire baja california sur is around 800,000 um and you're seeing a lot of expats come here, but we really have a, a an abundance of land. And um, for that reason, there's it's it's super easy to fly here. But on top of that, uh, we've owned real estate in the Riviera Maya in markets right around Tulum. Um, completely different market, but still the same thing. Basically buying real estate that's dominate, denominated in the U.S. style. There's going to be some uh, intrinsically, you know, charges that are that are related to the so and we're noticing that more so right now especially on pre-construction and, and development when the peso was at 20 to 1 now it's around 17 to 1 so um developers costs have increased because of that because they're re receiving um uh prices and payments in the dollar so prices go to kind of um so you have you have a lot of uh things that uh, you wouldn't necessarily think you know, it is uh, dollar denominated that's other risk as well but uh, we generally focus and 90 percent of what i do is in this area this market in los cabos and it's a hot market you know traffic's growing nine percent a year we have the second fastest 
growing population in Mexico. And um, it's just, I I see probably Mo the next 15 to 20 years, it's just literally just trying to keep up with demand. And then it could quote unquote, become a mature market. Wow. You know, when Americans think about Mexico and, or certain parts of Mexico, they have certain, you know, preconceptions or certain imagery of, uh, let's say, nefarious activities, right? Um, what is the environment like in in Cabo? Um, uh, you talked about, you know, or you mentioned how it's a, it's a breach front market. Um, how is it in terms of like the safety and in terms of like crime? Uh, what is the general atmosphere and environment like there? Good question. It's, it's one I get a lot. Uh, generally, people that ask that question haven't actually been to Cabo themselves, because once you get down here, you'll, I mean, you'll you'll see, you know, for example, anytime I tour somebody from Seattle, first 15 minutes, where, where are the homeless people, you know, um, for, you know, so I get people from LA, where's the crime, you know, um, I would say that in all honesty, the the most scared that I get in Cabo is actually driving the interstate sometimes um, because it's the infrastructure still here is trying to keep up. We we can get into that later, but the property taxes here are super low and it is Mexico. So at the end of the day, we have such a fast growing population that the infrastructure can't keep up. But back to safety, you know, my son here is four and a half years old. He goes to a really good private school here. Um, I, I feel completely safe, you know, um, and I come from New Orleans and it's, it's ironic. I go home and literally, I think, uh, New Orleans, mm-hmm. New Orleans had like, uh, over 800 cars stolen in January, it came out to something like 25 or 20 vehicles stolen a day. And when I went home for Christmas, people are like, you're in Mexico. Is it dangerous there? And I'm like, man, there's been, you know, almost record setting murders here and, I find it a little ironic. So there is a narrative and there are certain parts of Mexico that I would call uh, that I would call dangerous. I would still say to a certain extent that is blown out by the media. Mm -hmm. And uh, furthermore, Cabo is at the tip of Baja, California. So the Baja Peninsula is longer than the Italian Peninsula. So it's really you're really flying here. Few people drive here, but at the end of the day, Cabo is really like an island. So it's very much isolated from the the rest of Mexico. You know, a lot of the news um, or anything that's happening is usually along the border. Um, so anyway, I find Cabo is a very safe place. My son's four and a half years old. I don't see myself or my wife leaving here until he's 18. You know, I just think that the opportunity is abundance and, um, you know, safety is not necessarily something that I'm thinking about. Mo, there's a, I live in an HOA community, but there's a bike and it literally has flat tires. It does not have a, and it's been there for months. If that was New Orleans, that bike would be gone within the hour. And it's, you know, it's sitting there with like, you know, the tires are just flat. So I think when people come down, they will no longer be asking that question. You know, uh, for example, like I, it here, you you get your gas pumped by somebody right now if they see that you're a gringo they might try to overcharge you that's something that i see that is much more common than somebody now, look if you're going out partying at two or three in the morning and you're in that scene i think you're trying you're actually inviting yourself into more trouble right but for the average citizen uh, i think cabo is very safe and i think most people here would would say that that have spent an extended period of time Oh, thanks uh, for explaining that. And yeah, it's important. You know, there are certain narratives and, you know, how things are portrayed on the TV a lot of times isn't really the reality. So I think it's important for the listeners to know that. Um, another thing that I'm sure probably people wonder about um, is language. So uh, if someone is an American or Canadian or someone is a, an English speaker, let's say, um, how will they be able to navigate um, that area? Do a lot of the people down there speak English as a second language? Yeah, so I describe Cabo as, you know, 50% Southern California and 50% Mexico. I have my typical buyer here, Mo, is generally, you know, uh, 45 to 60 years old. You know, so a lot of these people will buy and they're buying. They might buy like 
hey, we're going to retire in five years. This might become our rental pro or uh, our vacation home, but now or our second home, but right now it's going to be an investment property. And they always say like, hey, when we come down here, we're going to we're going to learn Spanish. We're going to get fluent. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, I don't want to be the bear of bad news, but you're not going to get fluent because everybody here speaks English. Um, and matter of fact, most Mexicans, I speak Spanish fluently and like, I'll go order a coffee sometimes and I'm speaking Spanish and the guy comes back in English. I'm <laughs> speaking back in Spanish. He's because they look at it as a way to practice English, which is their livelihood because tourism is the main industry here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and on top of that, as you get older, like my son is in a bilingual school, he's going to be fluent by the time he's seven in both languages. Right. But as you get older, it becomes harder and harder for your brain to learn a second language. So the reality is most Americans that I know here, matter of fact, like when I speak Spanish, people are like, wow, they're like, man, you don't even have an accent, you know, because, and they're just like shocked because very few Americans here actually truly speak Spanish. Some of them, yeah, they, they might be able to order a beer or a taco or something like that or say thank you. But at the end of the day, uh, language barrier is, is not going to be anything. And on top of it, you have a very large expat community here. So depending on where you're buying into um, or where you're going, a lot of your neighbors will be Canadians and Americans too. So, and look, that that can actually turn some people off. They want like a more authentic Mexico. So there's, there's certain areas where, you know, depending on what you're looking for, that can really um, be your cup of tea, right? And that could be like the Total Santos region. That's about an hour north of where it's more like a, uh, an old plantation uh, village that's artsy, a lot of culture, you know, Cabo San Lucas is more resorts, San Jose del Cabo is the art district. But at the end of the day, um, like I said, you're going to feel almost like an extension of the United States. I have my little sister lives in Austin, Texas, and she flies down here. And then uh, about a month later, she went to a wedding in Kiowa, South Carolina, and she was like, man, it's it's easier to get to Cabo than it is to a lot of places in within the continental United States, you know. So uh, and certain that's and that's one of the, the real strong parts about Cabo is that the flight traffic uh, continues to grow. I mean, like five flights a day from LA. It's crazy. Two from San Francisco, two from Dallas, two from Houston, you know, Denver. You have all these major cities. It's like really easy to get to. So you could literally fly home, you know, if you needed to visit family. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, good things associated with that. Oh, it's great to hear. Uh, what are some of the, uh, the pros and cons of uh, purchasing uh, Mexican real estate, uh, specifically down in Cabo where you are? Okay, so cons, I'll, I'll, I like to get into this one first. Um, you know, if I had to guess on a percentage basis, Bo, I'm going to say that 5% of property here is financed, which means that 95% is either cash or people are coming up with creative ways to finance either through like a Merrill Lynch account, borrowing against their, their money. But here, uh, you know, you're not going to be borrowing from a Mexican bank as an American. And if you were, your interest rates right now are going to be 10, 11%. Interest rates are historically much uh, larger than they are in the United States here in Latin America. So, and then you're not going to be borrowing from a U.S. bank. J.P. Morgan's not going to go and, hey, Mo, you know, like, let, let's underwrite this house in Cabo that you're looking for. You know, they're not going to do it. So you're really stuck with cross-border mortgage lenders. And right now there's about three of them. And they kind of were sticking to different areas you know, as to not compete. And that's changing. So I think we're still a ways away to making that a level playing field, which just means that you're going to be paying more. So if you were to borrow, you could do it through a company here. You might be, you know, you get 15, 20 and 25 year lengths, but you're probably going to be paying a lot more in fees. Like I would say almost like 15 grand in underwriting fees. And that really leaves people off and I don't blame them. And then you might be putting up to like three percent down as opposed to you know maybe 30 percent in the states so financing that's the big one the good thing about that is that 
what we saw during the pandemic mo was you know free money really low interest rates and that caused a lot of markets like it was game on risk on i can borrow money at, at damn near nothing and go put it into uh a, an asset like real estate and you saw these these numbers go through the roof we've seen some of those come back down but at the end of the day it's much more of a uh steady climb here and but the good news about it is it's not like the crash either so um those are two things that like really the big con and we have a, a mutual friend at a pmo and she couldn't wrap her head around the fact that she couldn't finance the property right and i completely understand that so um uh, a, a thing I really like about Cabo is, is that uh, on the pro side is that it's such a young market, you know? So one of my specialties is pre-construction and that's all about the developer, right? But we've seen the place that I'm in right now, Mo, um, is a three bedroom place that we bought in 2016 and compared to what it is now, uh, is just kind of, it, it just kind of nuts, you know? Um, and that's because like pre-construction, you know, it was literally, we, we, it was risk on. So, uh, pre-construction, my general, like thesis on it is it should be worth 20 to 25% more than when you put your money down. Um, and it depends on what phase the project is as it gets more built out, but there's just so much, you know, and for example, Mo, one thing that I, uh, I kind of cut my teeth with, with my, my mother and my father was fix and flips in new Orleans. That's not a huge market here because it's just all there's there's more land and a lot of the the building is new, you know. And then some of the older stuff is just it it's not going to be what you would the typical American would be looking at, right? So um, it's just a different market, um, and there are ways to get creative with that, right? But uh, it, it it depends on what you're looking on there. So there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good things. Um, there's some not so good things. Um, but at the end of the day, I've seen a lot of clients not only make money, but, you know, I've seen their quality of life increase, you know, and I, I've seen it too. Me and my dad, we got two of them and we kind of, we were kind of looking at each other. We're like, is this, are we missing something? Or like, can we do this? Should we do this? Should we double down? You know, and I kind of see the client and I'm like, Hey man, hold on, hold on. Let's, let's, you know, you literally just took possession of this unit. Let's, let's see what's going on. Right. So anyway, uh, that was a long, long answer, Mo, but there's, there's a lot that's good. And like I said, my, my biggest con would be the financing aspect. Yeah. And I could totally see that too. You know, people in the United States are used to using leverage, right? And so when they go out and buy real estate, whether it be commercial or residential, there's always that leverage component of it that they want to take advantage of. And in some cases, depending on, you know, for example, like if you get like an FHA, FHA loan here, right, you can put as much as just like, you know, three or three and a half percent, I think it is something like that. And other situations, maybe as low as like 10 percent. So when people are looking at real estate outside the United States, you know, like, for example, in Cabo, you know, um, they don't understand that in a lot of parts of the world, um, not just in Mexico, but in a lot of other parts of the world, um, people go out and buy real estate you know, by basically just all cash, or it's almost completely, maybe there's a small percentage of it that's, you know, not financed, but for the majority of the sale, it's all money that's being paid up front uh, to secure it. So, um, and I know that, uh, you know, that was one of the things that, you know, um, I I've always kind of like wondered about too, like when it comes to like Mexico and some of these other markets, like in Central America, like Costa Rica and so forth, that seems to be the general dynamics, you know, when I've talked to people in some of these other areas is that, yeah, the, the financing is is not really something that's, you know, readily done like it is in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, you got to think about, let's go back to uh, 2008, right? I'm, I know I wasn't here when, when all, all this went down, but, but to my knowledge, there were U.S. banks lending, but the foreclosure process is going to be much trickier here or somewhere like Costa Rica, then it would be to the point where, you know, the banks are just going to be like, Jamie Dimon's going to be like, you know, we're, we got enough in our own backyard. Why would we go do that? However, I see, I see this. There's no way because I look at, I mean, I spoke to somebody from Nashville yesterday, Mo, and I can almost finish people's sentences. They're like, it doesn't pencil in real estate is too expensive. You know, 
know what I was investing with then is not like it, it doesn't make sense anymore. Um, so plus, I mean, just like cost of living and it, like to be in a lot of, of markets in the United States, like it's tough. Like, I don't see how a teacher makes it. I don't see how a lot of people make it just with the cost. I was like the average price of a vehicle now is like 47,000, you know, like how do people, the way they can do it is through leverage. The United States is addicted to leverage and that's good to a certain extent, but that also comes crashing down as well. I think financing here is going to get better. Um, like I said, there's a company Maxine. and it's all, it's all us. It's uh, it's a group out of Austin, Texas. And I think as more and more people get and use these loans, it's become more and more affordable. So we'll, we'll see, but right now the financing thing is, is a big issue. And that's why, like I said, a lot of my, my clients are affluent, you know, wealthy, well-to-do, you know, 45 to 60 year olds that uh, they're like, Hey, I, I don't feel, you know, I have X amount in the stock market. I kind of want to take that out and diversify into something cool. My family can use it, you know, but um, at the end of the day, that's, that's a big con. And you know what, when you think about it, that's also kind of a, a, a an advantage or a benefit too, because that reduces the amount of speculation. So uh, when people are able to borrow money, especially borrow, you know, at very low rates, you know, it feels speculative behavior. So although we've been talking about it, you know, as a con, I could also flip the script and also say that it's actually a very, uh, it's a, it's a pro, uh, it's, a, it's an advantage, right? Because it reduces the amount of speculation. And so if there is a slowdown in the economy down there, or there is a global slowdown, uh, let's say in the, in, the, in the global economy, right? that um you know how much will that affect a market where there isn't much spec speculation you wouldn't really expect it to as much right i mean for example look what's happened in the last few months or, or this year you know uh, in a lot of residential markets for example in the us you know like uh, austin you mentioned where your sister lives right austin's had you know quite a bit of slowdown and there's you know people could argue there's been a lot of speculation in those types of markets because it's been hot for so long so uh, we got to have to keep that in mind, too, that although financing can be a challenge or a hurdle, at the same time, it also reduces the amount of speculation that takes place. And so when there are slowdowns, it doesn't mean that, you know, the value of your real estate or your property is going to plummet um, unless there's something more significant going on. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it uh, once again, double edged sword, I, I think you you don't have the same upside sometimes and so it's not going to go up as drastically but also uh you're not going to have the the crashes dragged as drastically you know i know a guy in the tulum market and was big him and you just say you know all, all the buyers that were paying cash they're not going to sell for 50 percent on there which what you were kind of seeing what happened in like 2009 2010 people are just trying to get out as quickly as they could and it just wasn't happening these people are just kind of either sitting on it or um they didn't need it anyway so i i think there's exceptions to the rule but it, it I, I i think you're right you can look at it as a pro and a con yeah uh, you mentioned about one of your specialties is in pre-construction mm -hmm. and that um you know uh you're kind of looking or when people are purchasing these kind of pre-construction uh properties um, that it should be worth like 20 to 25% more when it's completed. Can you talk a little bit about how that process works and uh, with regards to buying something that's uh, on a pre-construction basis rather, rather than buying something that's already built? Yeah, absolutely. So a big part of the market here is pre-construction. Um, I've seen, you know, I have this video, a lot of my business comes from YouTube mode, but I have this video and it was like, uh, condos under 200,000 and it's it got reached You know, I did it like two years ago and, um, now these same condos are like 350. And like I said, we're speaking like without leverage. Right. Um, so you start seeing like some of these developers can severely underpriced just in order to start getting. So like when the risk is on, when it's just dirt, right. Then you see it. You hear some horror stories where people might buy in a project that don't get built out at all, right? or, you know, they're delayed three years, you know, like that's not a good situation, regardless of if you're increasing, you know, the price has gone up since you bought, you know, people just, they don't want that. Um, 
So I generally would say like, hey, let's take a look at this. If let's say like this, this condo is $300,000, like this should be worth like 360, 375 upon delivery. If it's not, let's look at something that's built out or let's look at another project because we're not getting compensated for the risk. Another, and so there's a, there's a group here and they actually, they sold out to like uh, Anheuser-Busch, InBev, um, they sold, and like they have a lot of money. And I was speaking to these guys and they bought an old, an old hotel and they're turning it into condos. And this took a while to go through and they underwrote everything at 20 to one. Okay. Now the peso is 17 to one. So their costs have increased, you know, uh, 20%, something like that. And then, uh, Here's something else, like I'm telling you, like right now, Cabo is a growth market. It is hard to find. It's not just hard to find labor, but it's like there were no people here. So 80% of the labor for these construction projects come from mainland Mexico. You know, one of the builders I work with, they're bringing people in from Pueblo. So the costs have increased on, on that. And I could get into the numbers on that. But these are risks that we're seeing that I hadn't, you know, that weren't part of the market for the past four or five years. Because there's always going to be more risk with a pre-construction project than something that's built out for obvious reasons, right? And it depends on where that is. Um, another thing is, is we have, look, this is the hottest market in Mexico right now. Like it is. So we see a lot of people uh, from like Tulum. And I think people in Tulum will tell you that Tulum is frothy. So a lot of these developers are trying to come over here to Cabo. And I see these, they come over with a little arrogance. Hey, we've done these projects. We've done this. Well, Mo, it's kind of like doing a project in LA and then trying to go to New York. And we're sitting there and like this one project we walked away from, you know, because we were representing it to sell it. And they just, they, they knew everything. And I mean, I'm not really in communication with this group anymore. And, and not in a bad way, just like, hey, you, I, best of luck to you to do this project. And it's it doesn't look like it's going very well. It hasn't been um, very well accepted from the market. Um, and it was just little things like, oh, wait, we've done this. Like over in the Riviera Maya, they don't have an MLS system. Here we have MLS data, you know, for the past 30 years. So while we pull up numbers, you know, it's, it's very much an American market. You walk around, Mo, you're going to see Century 21, uh, you're going to see Engels and Volcker. You're going to see all these U.S. companies, you know, and that doesn't mean anything other than the fact that it's a very similar process to buy real estate here than it would be in the States. Whereas these other ones, other markets where you don't have an MLS system, it's like you're very dependent upon the broker, the agent being a good a good agent and providing you with information. And that can, that certainly are people, but at the end of the day too, there's a certain type that I call the mania boys that will prey upon Americans and see you as like a gringo walking in here and trying to get everything that you're worth. And unfortunately that's a reality of the situation. And those people, and they're like, Oh, don't, you know, they become bitter about the situation and then they go home and they tell everybody it's a bad place and all that. That's just a lose, lose across the board. So there's all sorts of things, but at the end of the day, pre-construction is a great market. It just depends. Now I can say this, Mo, I would not want to be in a pre-construction project here. I want to say here in Mexico when 2008 happens, like that's, like you know, it's just not going to be a fun situation. So I think you also have to pay attention to market cycles. And I personally think that we're getting closer to a market cycle. So it's like, Hey, let's, let's kind of, Let's go and sit back and, you know, and, but once again, it, it all depends on what that bill of client is looking for. Yeah. And that's a good point you brought up about where you are in the overall market cycle of, you know, in the overall real estate market cycle. Right. So as you get further and further into that cycle, you have to expect that there's going to be some type of correction and therefore you want to be more conservative, right. In your decision-making and in terms of the types of deals you go after. Here's, here's one more thing too. Um, you know, what happens in the States right now, a lot of time is, you know, it's like, you know, this mo people are syndicating and they're buying apartment buildings and, or they're developing and they're, you know, using other people's money here. They just, it's, it's a different 
game. So what happens is these developers, they're selling, if they're building a 300 unit complex, they're going to be selling those off individually, as opposed to like keeping it as like one owner or a group of owners. Right now, most of these guys are going to be going and getting financing from a Mexican bank, right? It's going to be a higher interest rate, but you know, they'll, they'll make it, they'll make it pencil. Some of these developers are going to be using your money. So what happens in a rising market like we've had for the past five, six years, you know what I mean? Where it's go like, hey, anybody, it'd be like, you know, anybody can make money in the stock market when it's been like that. You know, anybody could make money in that. But what happens when the tide turns? Those are the types of projects. And there's no way really for somebody from the outside to be able to get it. It has to be somebody that has like the local knowledge to do that, you know. And that's really where it's, you know, like, hey, I don't want to get anybody into that situation, you know, um, nor does anybody else, right? But when, if the tide changes here, it can be just as, if not worse than somewhere in this, and you have horror stories like that in the States too, that happened in 2008, um, specifically in regards to development, but it's, it's definitely something to keep in mind for sure. Yeah, and even more reason to be working with someone who has intimate knowledge of the market and the players, uh, the overall uh, cycle, you know, the real estate cycle that we're in, uh, which has gone up for a number of years now. So uh, it's good to have someone with that type of knowledge um, in order to kind of navigate through all the variables. And uh, especially when you're, when you're looking at buying, you know, real estate outside the U.S., right? So all that stuff, you know, becomes very valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you you help Americans buy real estate down there. Um, what do you see in terms of like the typical buyer? Are they mainly using uh, the property as like a vacation home or do they want to use it more as an investment property? Uh, that's a good question. So I'd say a lot of them are what I call the 50-50 crowd where it's, you know, um, they'll use it as a vacation home for the family or and then when they're not using it they'll use it as a short-term rental right so i see a lot of people do that like they might spend anywhere from one week to two months of the year you know and then they're going to rent it out the rest of the time then you have a lot of you know like my parents neighbor uh they're snowbirds they're from canada they're from toronto and they come for about six months a year and then they're back in Canada for about six months out of the year. And then you have people that, you know, they just want the vacation home. Like they don't really necessarily need it. Um, the rental income, but I think what we're seeing is a lot of people that are looking to do the Airbnb thing. And, uh, like I said, there's, I can look out my window right now, Mo, and I see a lot of towers going up and a like, you know, almost I'd say like 70% of those are going to people that are just going to be putting it on the market. So I think there's a certain price point here where it's going to get a little saturated in the Airbnb market. Um, so it all depends on what the price point is, but I think a lot of people right now are coming in, even though it's, it's cash buys, they're still going to be putting it on the market as an Airbnb. And I think depending on where that is, what price point is, it really dictates. But I do see a certain price range where I do think it not getting frothy, but you're going to have a much more supply coming on the market. Oh, good point. Yeah. So um, when you look at like short term, the short term rental market over there, um, has it been do you see more supply coming onto the market as a result of people buying and like you said, maybe spending several weeks or a few months? you know, in the home and then making the home available as a short-term rental to generate some income while it's not in use. Are you starting to see a, more of a supply issue taking place? I would say absolutely. You know, in San Lucas, there's a lot of uh, condo towers going up and I'm, t I'm telling you, Mo, this was just, it's, it's kind of blows my mind that in go back like 2019, right before the pandemic, uh, it just blows my mind how much of this was just like this gorgeous bay and just land. You know, and now these look property taxes are super low here. So these people have like no incentive to sell. Now they're starting to see the price justification, you know, so they've sold and all these developers are coming in and you have pro 
you know, I see a new project almost every day. It's not like Tulum, like Tulum had like 400 projects going on at once last year. And, um, a lot of people there say that that was frothy and they're really calling for a correction here. We're not because the, uh, the demand is still so high, but there are certain price points in certain places where, yes, I do believe many people are going in and buying, uh, an Airbnb just for that. And they're, they're going off numbers that might be showing today, but in the future that might get a little bit more, um, competition, a little bit too much oversupply. Yeah, that makes sense. You mentioned uh, property taxes uh, being low there. Can you give us some idea of what property taxes look like, like um, on a percentage basis, and and does it vary from region to region? Like, would the ta would the property taxes in Kabul be different than some of these other areas you've been talking about? Yeah, so Kabul's got the lowest property taxes in Mexico. It's point one percent. So if you have a three hundred thousand dollar condo. You're paying $300 a year. And here's the thing, Bo. In Mexico, in Latin America, is a very like notorious for tax evasion, right? So if you pay your property taxes in January, 25% off. You pay in February, 20% off. You pay in March, 15% off. So not only are they less, but if you pay up front, you're paying like a fraction. You know, like my little sister has a condo in Austin, you know, and I think that's that's close to 2%. So it would take like 20 years for a condo here to pay off there. Um, and there's a downside to that too, Mo. Like these people will, they'll own this land and it'll be like, hey, I want to buy it. And they'll be like, nah. You know, whereas, or they'll just have like abandoned buildings on it. And be like, nah. You know, whereas in the United States, an entrepreneur will come in and do that. But they also, that owner has the incentive to get rid of it. If you're paying property taxes of 1% or 2% a year year that's eating into you know that's significant enough to make a difference here it's like ah, i don't i don't need to sell this you know so there's a downside to having low prop taxes on top of the fact that we need infrastructure you know and then i come from new orleans so i can't really point the finger our politicians have have been known to uh not spend every cent uh I would say, honestly, so I would say there's probably a little bit of that going on here. So on top of low property taxes and slower, you know, uh, ways of spending it, um, I think you could argue that that would be people would be in line with raising that a little bit to pay for infrastructure if they knew, in fact, it was going to infrastructure. Oh, OK, yeah, I mean, 0.1 percent. I mean, that's that's unheard of. Yeah, it's it's nuts. That's extremely low. Um, if an American is buying real estate down in that area, um, besides coming up with the money, um, is there anything else that they that needs to be done? Like, do they need to be vetted by the Mexican government? Do they need to do they need to is there a background check? I mean, what types of things do, do Americans need to go through or foreigners need to go through in order to buy real estate down there? Yeah, so um, you're definitely gonna have to do like a KYC, know your client, you know, and that's for anti money laundering. You know, and that's not just Americans that have to do that. That's anybody that's buying here um, to prevent money laundering. That's a huge thing. Um, another topic, I think it, uh, we're kind of almost too late into the the podcast again in this, but like depending on what you're doing, the ownership, how you're going to set it up, are you going to set it like as an LLC, which is completely different than the States? Are you going to set it up as a, you know, it depends on what you're doing, right? But uh, there's a lot of nuances to to all that. Okay. But for the most part, there's there's no big hurdles or no, any big challenges. Once once a buyer has the necessary funds to purchase the property, everything else from that point just becomes more just like, you know, paperwork related. Exactly. So your typical transaction here would be like I got one right now that's going money's going into escrow. It's uh, escrow company based in Austin, Texas. You know, we're in the due diligence period. We're seeing what we can do. If we don't like what way the wind is blowing, we get our money back minus an escrow fee. Um, and then our attorney, I always use a closing attorney because it's much more common here to have, you know, Larry says he owns the land, but really Karen owns the land, you know, and they're selling. Obviously, it's going to be a different name than that. Right. But um, uh, you're going to have an attorney looking at making sure that that person actually owns the land you know there's no liens on it things like that um so without a doubt that is like 
that's something that I hand over to a closing attorney every time just to make sure that we're everything is is good, right? Especially when it comes to developers and making sure they have all the paperwork. Because a lot of times they're doing like joint ventures with the landowner and things like that. And you just want to make sure that everything is is good. So yeah, at the end of the day, uh, it's pretty straightforward. You have the, like I said, it's mainly going to be a cash purchase. And as long as you have that, it's like, you know, money in escrow, pretty much all purchases here, which is very reassuring for Americans. Due diligence period, you know, and then depending on if that's pre-construction or whatever, um, and then money's released uh, as it gets signed and transfer of ownership. Okay, sounds pretty straightforward. And just to kind of like touch upon something you mentioned about hiring an attorney, essentially the attorney is basically functioning and doing the work that you would expect like a title company to do here in the United States, right? By doing a title search and and making sure that the person who's selling the property actually owns it, correct? Yeah, exactly. And I think like in a, a market like Cabo where it's you, know, you have a significant uh, amount of foreign buyers, you've eliminated a lot of the activity. But, you know, I, I'll have people reach out and they're like, hey, I'm buying uh, like a piece of land and, you know, some area in Mexico that I'm not really familiar with. And I'm like, I would 100 percent go hire a closing attorney, you know, or somebody review the paperwork. So yes, that is, uh, that is very, you know, just because you don't know what's, you know, especially in an area that maybe they're not going to be so many Americans buying, right? you want to make sure that that happens. Cause I sit down with, uh, an attorney at war and we always, we, we film and we do uh content and man, he's, he's got some stories. They're generally from different areas and from a, a different, uh, era, but, uh, I've heard, you know, some people buying something that they think they're they're going to get and it not being the case, you know. I see. And this is all part of doing proper due diligence, of course. A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Um, Fletcher, do you have any kind of final thoughts that you'd like to share? Yeah, well, Mo, first, thanks for having me on. And um, second, you know, I, I chose to be in Cabo. I chose to raise my family here. You know, uh, I actually had people within my family being like, Hey, you got better opportunity here in, in the United States. Why don't you go back for education, hospital purposes, which, you know, the more I stay here, the more comfortable I get, the more I think that it was the right decision for me. So I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be based in Baja California, sir, here in, in Los Cabos for a while. Um, part of that is because I love it. The other part is because there's just opportunity here. So um, if anybody's interested in, in finding out more about owning real estate abroad uh, or in Cabo or any questions about, you know, lifestyle here, things like that, I am available. So, uh, but uh, with that, Mo, thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, and Fletcher, and, and for people that are interested in uh, learning more about the real estate down there and getting in contact with you, how can they do that? Go to my uh, my web, it's cabokey.com, so it's A-B-O-K-E-Y.com. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Fletcher, for coming on to the show today. Thanks so much for having me, Mo. Yeah, I really appreciate you sharing your insights with the audience. And uh, that's all for today. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And until next time, have a great week. Thank you for tuning in to this week's show. If you are interested in learning how alternative investments can help you build purpose-driven wealth, sign up on the High Rise Capital website to receive our monthly newsletter and free investor ebook. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review. Thank you for listening to Purpose Driven Wealth, the podcast for empowered investors.